Hello and welcome to lecture 7 for the graduate course ECE 254B uh, Parallel Processing. Uh, with this lecture, we start part 2, prime, two double prime in the textbook. This is basically the second half of the current part 2 in the textbook, expanded to include additional material. And the four chapters in part two double prime deal with the circuit model of uh, parallel computing. And uh, as we did for the previous two parts, we will devote three lectures to this part. Uh, in this lecture, I will cover sorting and selection networks, chapter seven. Then uh, in the next lecture, lecture eight, I will cover search acceleration circuits. Uh, that's basically 8a, which includes um, most of its material comes from chapter eight, current chapter eight. And then the, uh, there's a typo here. This should be chapters 8b and 8c. Uh, these two will be covered in a single lecture, arithmetic and counting circuits, and the Fourier transform circuit. So these are basically, uh, whereas the first two chapters are essentially non-numerical computations, uh, the last two deal with numerical, examples of numerical computations. Okay, so chapter seven deals with sorting and selection networks. Uh, I've included sorting in the first chapter on the circuit model because sorting is a familiar problem and we have uh, dealt with it both uh, in uh, ordinary programming sequential programming, so to speak. And we also saw some examples of sorting algorithms in the uh, previous lectures. So by now we know what it means to sort data in parallel. And uh, we will show that we can go from algorithm to architecture. Uh, not vice versa. In other words, we are used to being given an architecture such as the von Neumann model of computation and then develop algorithms for it. Uh, here we are going in the reverse direction. Uh, we are going from uh, an algorithm to an architecture. We, we basically design hardware to execute our algorithms. Okay, so let's get started with some basic concepts. Uh, sorting network, uh, sometimes called n sorter when it has n inputs, uh, receives n inputs x0, x1 up to xn minus 1 on the left and produces n outputs y0, y1 up to yn minus 1 on the right. And the outputs are a permutation of the inputs, satisfying these inequalities, y0. So I'm assuming ascending order, sorting in ascending, or non-descending more accurately. y0 less than or equal to y1, less than or equal to y2, all the way up to less than or equal to yn minus 1. In other words, uh, uh, the, when you go from y0 to y n minus 1, you never, the values never go down. They either stay the same or go up. So this is called uh, non-descending sorting. Okay, the building block that we will use for the most part to design n sorters are two sorters. So two sorter basically is a sorting network, sorting circuit, that receives two inputs, input zero and input one, 
and uh, outputs the smaller of the two, of, if they're equal, you know, the, either one of the two, uh, and the top output, and the larger of the two, again, if they're equal, one of the values, on the lower output. So min, the smaller value goes uh, on the top output, max, the larger value goes on the bottom output. Now, because we'll be using a lot of these blocks in constructing uh, uh, sorting networks, we are going to develop a shorthand notation to make it easier to draw diagrams consisting of many two input sorting networks. We basically draw just a vertical line between two, two horizontal lines to show that there's a box here that takes these two inputs and produces those two outputs. Uh, and we almost always assume that the uh, top output is the smaller value, and the bottom output is the larger value. If we want to explicate this, we sometimes put an arrowhead on this line, meaning that sorting goes in this direction, smaller, larger. Okay, with this notation, we can also reverse this arrow and use a two-input sorter that sorts in reverse direction, puts the uh, larger value at the top and smaller value at the bottom. Okay, to make things even more simple, we eliminate these two dots because it's implicit when a line segment connects two horizontal lines, then it's basically a box that compares these two values and sorts them at the output. So this makes it even easier to draw diagram. Again, if we want to explicitly specify uh, the direction of sorting, we use an arrow instead of just a line segment. OK, now I mentioned that uh, at the circuit uh, for the circuit level of parallel computation, we are operating very close to actual hardware so that whatever we do, for example, we design a circuit, uh, we can very easily uh, determine how complex it is, how many elements it uses, how many hardware elements. Do we count gates or area in terms of uh, VLSI layout? It's pretty easy. And also the latency can be either modeled using uh, latency modeling techniques for hardware, or it can be measured if we go and actually implement the circuit. Now, the two-sorter, ignore the block on the right for now. Focus on the, the block on the left. Uh, a two-sorter is a circuit that receives two k-input integers. Okay, uh, these can be signed integers or unsigned integers. Uh, it could also be potentially floating point numbers, although we don't use sorting networks for sorting floating point. So these are, let's imagine these to be k bit unsigned numbers, a and b. They go in, they're compared, so there's a comparator for numbers, for integers here. And that comparator tells us whether b is less than A. So if B is actually less than A, this signal will be 1. If B is greater than or equal to A, this signal will be 0. Okay? If this signal is 0, in other words, uh, B is greater than or equal to A, in other words, A is the smaller of the two, then the 0 input to this control input to this multiplexer uh, causes A to go to the top output. Otherwise, A would go to the bottom output, and B would go, in other words, they are switched. So if A, if, if B is greater than or equal to A, then the two inputs simply go straight through to the two outputs. If B is less than A, then we have to switch the two values. B will go to the top. So basically, the hardware for a two-sorter 
consists of a comparator, which is a fairly simple circuit, and two, a k-bit comparator, and two multiplexers. Okay, very simple in terms of hardware. Now, if these were signed numbers, then we would have a signed comparator circuit. Basically, if the signs are different, then uh, the one that has negative sign is the smaller one. If the signs are the same, we do the regular unsigned comparison. Okay, so it's pretty easy to implement the circuit with not too many uh, circuit elements, not too many gates. Okay, now because we will be designing sorting networks uh, typically with a large number of inputs, uh, 8, 16, 32, if each of these inputs is k bits wide, let's say 32 bits wide, and we want to put a sorting network on a chip, we would need a lot of pins, okay? So if this is a 32 bit, if these are 32 bit wide numbers, and let's say we have 32 inputs to sort, then that's 1,024 bits of information at the input, okay, and the 1024 bit at the output, okay, so even though the circuit itself may fit on the chip, there are just too many I.O. pins for most uh, chips that we design nowadays, uh, a couple thousand pins. So it's attractive to contemplate the use of bit serial comparators. So here, in this version of the two sorter on the right, A and B come in one bit at a time, most significant bit first. So now for each of the inputs, for each of the data inputs, we have just one pin for input and one pin for output. So 32 inputs means 64 pins, which is much more reasonable. Okay, so how does the comparison in serial work? It's pretty easy. When you compare two numbers of the same bit, let's say 32 bits, beginning with the most significant bit, then as long as the bits coming in are equal, the two numbers are equal. Okay, so the first few bits of the two numbers may be equal, then the two numbers are equal so far. As soon as one of the numbers has a one, and the other one has a zero, that that number, then that number is judged to be larger. And then basically we stop comparing because from that point on, uh, so let's say we determine that A is larger, in which case A should go to the bottom output from that point on. So initially when the two bits are equal, we just forward them directly, doesn't matter. If they're both zeros, then we get two zeros at the output. If they're two ones, we get two ones. However, if we determine that A is larger, then from that point on, we direct A, the bits of A to the lower output, and the bits of B to the upper output. These two flip-flops shown here basically keep track of, so at first they're both zeros, meaning that we have not determined which of the two inputs is larger. <clears throat> this flip-flop being set, the top flip-flop being set, indicates that B is less than A, and then that flip-flop will remain set for the rest of the duration of this input being processed. If this flip-flop, the bottom flip-flop is set, then A is less than B. Okay, if A is less than B, okay, if a B is less than A, then that's when we, the signal becomes one, and therefore the two inputs will be switched. Okay, then once this flip-flop is set, in other words, Q bar for that flip-flop is zero. 
that prevents from this flip-flop being set. Similarly, this flip-flop being set, the Q bar being one, prevents this flip-flop, uh, this gate allowing the set signal to be generated and setting. So one flip-flop is set and will remain set for the duration of this input coming in. Now this is even simpler in terms of uh, components, two flip-flops, two three input gates, and two multiplexers. Okay, so I've shown you this, these designs to say that whenever I draw these boxes or the vertical sticks that represent them, I'm actually drawing a circuit, even though I'm not showing these details in each diagram. We can always go and replace each of these boxes or each of these sticks with either this version of the two sorter or this version. So we really are working at the circuit at the gate level. <clears throat> okay, so we design sorting networks and one of the worries that we have is to verify that our design is correct. Just like when we write a program, we want to make sure that the program is correct. For a sorting network, we want to do the same thing. So here, somebody gave me this sorting network or a stick diagram version shown on the right. Okay, notice that this box and this box are represented by these two sticks. This box is represented by this stick. And these two boxes, okay, rather than take this line and put it up there so that it goes into that box, we keep this line in place and put the box between these two lines, the top line and the third line, okay? So this is the third line and the top line are input to this box. So that's why I put that box over there. This makes drawing of the diagrams even simpler because we have a bunch of horizontal lines from inputs to outputs and then a bunch of vertical sticks that represent comparators. Notice that even though these vertical lines uh, intersect multiple lines, there's no ambiguity. Uh, the connection of the box is always to the first line that it intersects and the last line. All the intermediate lines, there's no connection there, okay? Similarly, this box is between the second line from the top and the fourth line at the bottom. Okay, so somebody gives me this and claims that this is a, a design for a four input sorting network. Here are the four inputs, here are the four outputs. How do I go about verifying that this is indeed a correct design? Well, an obvious strategy is basically to provide different inputs all possible input patterns and observe that the circuit sorts it correctly. So for example, I provide 3251. The actual numbers are not really important, but the pattern, in other words, this is the smallest at the bottom. The second smallest is on the second line. The third smallest so this could have been, for example, 3281 or 3280. It's the same pattern as long as sorting uh, is concerned. Okay, so 3 and 2 go into this comparator. They're out of order. They're put in order. 5 and 1 go into this comparator. They're out of order. They're put in order. Then 1 and 2 go into this comparator. They're put in order. Three and five go into this comparator. They're in order, so just they go straight through. And finally, three and two go to this comparator, and they're put in order, and the input is sorted. So the sorting network works for this particular input pattern. But we have to provide all the 24 factorial patterns regarding the ordering of the inputs in order to make sure that this sorting network works correctly. 
That may not be a big task for a four input sorting network, but if you go to a 16 input sorting network, 16 factorial is a huge number. And therefore, it would take a long time to verify that the sorting network uh, is correct. So that was method one, exhaustive test. Try all the n factorial possible input orders. Method two is to use an ad hoc proof. Some sort of uh, mathematical proof that this is correct and not have to test it exhaustively. In this case, the proof is rather simple because you notice that these two inputs are compared. This is the smaller of those two. Okay, These two inputs are compared. This is the smaller of these two. So then the smaller of the top two and the smaller of the bottom two are compared. The smaller of those is the smallest overall. Similarly for the large, this is the larger of the top two. This is the larger of the bottom two. The larger of those two is basically the largest overall. And then these two, whether doesn't matter if they're already in order or not in order. If they're not in order, the order will be fixed by this comparator and we are done. So this was a proof. Basically, I, I used the uh, reasoning to show that this is actually a correct force order. But again, as the size of the sorting networks grow, grows, uh, it becomes harder and harder to apply this kind of reasoning. The third method is an interesting method that we find very useful, not only in this chapter, but in analyzing sorting networks throughout uh, the course. Later we will see that this is used for other architectures as well. Okay, this is the use of the zero one principle. You may already be familiar with zero one principle. If you have studied Knut's volume three, book on the art of computer programming. Uh, the zero one principle says a comparison based sorting algorithm is correct if and only if it correctly sorts all zero one sequences. In other words, I don't have to test this network with all possible uh, n factorial permutations that are possible for the order of the input, but I only need to test it for two to the n combinations of zeros and ones. In other words, I test it for inputs that are zeros and ones. If it works in every case, then it's guaranteed to work for arbitrary inputs. Now, two to the n is a much smaller number than n factorial as n grows, okay? So instead of eight factorial, for an eight input sorting network, I have two to the eight, which is uh, 256 test cases, okay? So it reduces the number of cases. So why is it that the zero one principle works? Okay, here, suppose I have an invalid six order. There are six inputs and I've shown a sample in a set of inputs, three, six, nine, one, eight, five. What does it mean for this to be invalid? It means that I can find at least two consecutive outputs that are out of order. Because if all pairs of outputs are in order, then the sorting has occurred correctly. So this being an invalid sorter means that I can find, like in this case, two values that are out of order. There may be more than two values, but at least a single pair of values at the output will be out of order. So this is six, this is five, and therefore the sorting is incorrect. One, three, six, five, eight, nine is not sorted. Now let me replace all the values. So uh, take these two values that are out of order. The smaller of the two is five, the larger of the two is six. Replace the inputs that are less than or equal to five with zero. 
So replace 3 with 0, 1 with 0, 5 with 0. And everything that is greater than or equal to 6 with uh, 1s. 6 is 1, 9 is 1, 8 is 1. My claim is that if this sequence was not correctly sorted, then this sequence also will not be correctly sorted. Basically, the comparisons that have, uh, were problematic here and did not switch these two will not be switching these two values. And therefore, at the output, this output will be 1 and this output will be 0. Okay, this, this is other than a formal proof, but basically I tried to give you the intuition behind why the 0, 1 principle works. Okay, when I design a sorting network, uh, I will be interested in uh, judging how good the sorting network is. And there are at least three figures of merit that I can look at. One is cost, which I measure in terms of number of comparators. So I can say that the cost of this network is five, five units. There are five comparators. Of course, the wiring pattern between the comparators is also important in VLSI layout, but I'm going to ignore that in order to have a rather simple to uh, compute figure of merit. So number of comparators is, an, uh, is a measure of cost. A delay is the number of levels of comparators on the critical path. So if you trace signals from left to right in the circuit, in the worst case, a signal can go through one, two, three comparators. So there are three levels. Okay, this constitutes one level, these two. These two constitute one level, and this is a third level. So this particular force order has... Uh, a latency or delay of three units, a cost of five units, where unit is the cost of a comparator, and unit of delay is the delay of uh, a two comparator. And then if we want to study uh, cost delay trade-offs, then cost and delay is a good figure of merit. In other words, the product of these two, trying to minimize this, uh, minimizes cost and minimizes delay, but also allows us trade off. So, in other words, uh, if we can cut delay by two while increasing cost by a factor of two, that may be deemed a good trade off. So, make the circuit twice as fast, uh, but, have, but pay twice as much in terms of cost or increase delay by 10%, reduce uh, the cost by, save uh, by 10% in cost, if you're willing to have a 10% greater delay. And for this particular circuit, cost delay product is 15. Okay, if I use cost as a figure of merit, then I can come up with uh, circuits that uh, use the minimum number of comparators. So here, you see the best six input sorting network in terms of cost, the best nine input sorting network, 10, 12, 13, and 16. Now here you realize that these sorting network can be quite complex so when you go to 16 input, notice how many comparators I have and how many levels of comparators, quite a few. More importantly, it uh, becomes a bit worrisome. How do we go about designing such networks? You know, how, how did the designer of this network come with this particular design? 
there is some regularity in the early part of the circuit, but it seems, you know, comparators are more or less randomly placed later on. Okay, well, this is something we'll tackle at the end of the lecture, later in the lecture. But you can see some structure here that may give you ideas about how to proceed. For example, these three comparators up here constitute a three input sorting network. So basically, it seems that the strategy for this nine input sorting network is to sort the first three inputs, then sort the middle three inputs, then sort the last three inputs. We now have three sorted lists of size three. Then you take the smallest of the value from this three sorter and the smallest of value from this three sorter and the smallest and use a three sorter there. And this gives you the smallest value overall. Similarly, the middle values are sorted and the largest values are sorted. And again, this gives you the largest value. But still, that's not as easy to explain the rest of the network. <clears throat> okay, similarly, in this circuit, you see four input sorting network. So apparently the design of this 12 input sorting network is based on three four input sorting networks at the beginning and then some kind of merging merging of those sorted lists. So I have three sorted lists of size four at this point and then I merge those using this design which again isn't clear how it was derived. Now, if I take delay as a figure of merit, these are some of the best known sorting networks. So for 6, 9, 10, 12, and 16 inputs. Notice this has 12 modules. In the previous one, we also had 12 modules. But this one had five levels for six inputs. This one also has five levels. So it seems that the, the most economical and the fastest six input sorting network can be the same. Now, how do I say that this network has five levels? Let, let's examine this in more detail uh, to get a feel for how to determine um, so the levels that I count here are 1, 2, the part that is in circle counts as one level, 3, 4, and 5. Why do I count all three of these comparators as one level? That's because they deal with different values. In other words, this comparator compares the first and the third, this one the second and the fifth, and this one the fourth and the sixth. So they operate in parallel. There's no data dependency between them. So that's why they take, all three take one unit of time to do their job, okay? Whereas between this level and this level, there is data dependency because the output of this comparator is an input of this. One output of this comparator is an input of the next one, okay? So that's why these count as three separate levels. It gets kind of uh, messy, uh, for example, trying to determine the number of levels here is not as easy. You can see, for example, that this comparator is completely independent of this one because they deal with different lines, different values. This one is independent of both of them. And this one is independent of both of them. And this one is independent of both of them. Okay, so you can basically lump those comparators that are independent of each other into a single level. But it's not always as easy to do that.
Okay, well, the first bad news about designing sorting networks is that other than these small networks, we really don't know how to design the most efficient sorting network, either the lowest cost or the highest speed. And this table from Wikipedia, I included here last year, and already I had to update it. So basically n going from 1 to 17, these are basically fairly small sorting network, up to 17 inputs. This is the depth of the best known sorting network with that many inputs. So for example, uh, for six inputs, the best known depth is five. Okay, for 16 inputs, the best known depth is nine. That's the delay. For 17, the best is 10. The size, these are the best that we know now. So for six, we can design it with 12 uh, comparators. And up to 10 inputs, these are optimal. In other words, this is probably the best we can ever hope for. In other words, you can design a 10 input sorting network, network with fewer than 29 comparators. But beginning with uh, numbers as small as 11, we are not, oh sorry, 11 and 12, it used to be, we didn't know whether these were optimal, but now they're known to be optimal. So with 11 inputs, 35 comparators are optimal. With 12 inputs, 39 comparators. Beginning with 13, we are not so sure. We do have a design that has 45 comparators, and we have proof that at least 43 comparators are needed. This is a lower bound. Remember I said we can theoretically prove lower bound sometimes. In this case, we were able to prove that 43 comparators, and this lower bound is improved over what we knew uh, about a year ago. The lower bound used to be 41, so there was a bigger gap between what uh, we have already achieved and what could potentially be the best possible. But we now know the gap has closed now. We still don't know whether this is optimal. It could be that we can design with 43 comparators or 44 comparators, but nobody has come up with such a design. Notice that we are only at 13 inputs, okay? Beginning at 13 inputs, we already uh, don't know how to design the best, uh, uh, the best uh, sorting network. And for 14, uh, 51 is what we have been able to do. 47 is the absolute best, the lower bound, and so on. The 17, what we have achieved, the 71 comparators. 60 is the proven lower bound. Okay? So, you know, this is sort of like a puzzle. It's not urgent to, you know, go and improve uh, this design from 60 to maybe 58 comparators. It's not a great difference, and you have to spend perhaps years trying to come up with a better design. But it's sort of like a puzzle that attracts some mathematicians and computer scientists who work on these. That's how basically these numbers change over time. So if you look maybe in two years or three years in uh, Wikipedia's table, you may see that seven, this 71 has been decreased to 70, let's say, just as an example, or this 60 has been raised to 62. In other words, lower bound improved by improved by increasing, upper bounds improved by decreasing, and when these two meet, then we have an absolutely optimal design, as is the case for 1 through 12 inputs. 
Now, the problem of determining whether a given candidate network is a sorting network is CoMP complete. Again, if you don't know what CoMP complete is, don't worry. It's sort of like MP complete, it's a difficult problem. Okay, so here I've shown two 10 input sorting networks. One uh, is a low cost version that uses 29 modules, but uses nine levels of comparators. The, the other one on the right is the fast version from the previous diagrams. It uses only seven levels, but it uses a few more modules. Okay, so if you Consider, you know, which which of these two is better? Which which of these two should I use? It seems that this uh, design on the right is better intuitively because by adding just two modules, a little bit of cost, I've decreased the latency from nine levels to seven levels. That's a significant reduction. Okay, this is where that cost delay product comes into play. The cost delay product for the design on the left is 261. The cost delay product for the design on the right is 217. So the design on the right is more cost effective. Okay, the most cost effective end sorter may be neither the fastest design nor the lowest cost design. Here I took the lowest cost design on this side, and the fastest design, and computed cost delay products, and concluded that this one is better than this one. In fact, there may be another design that has, let's say, eight levels, and has a lower cost delay product, okay? We don't know that, okay? At least I have not looked into that carefully to see if there is such a design. Anyway, so the most cost-effective end sorter may be neither the fastest design nor the lowest cost design. Okay, let's now look into techniques for designing sorting network. Okay, uh, on the left, I've shown a diagram that I claim is a valid six-input sorting network. Remember, these vertical lines are comparators to input sorting elements, okay? So how is it that I'm sure that this is, I could go and use the zero one principle and input all 64 possible zero one patterns here and observe that it sorts it. I can also do the following. Let's rotate this design by 90 degrees. And here we see that what is happening in this network is basically a hardware implementation of the even odd transposition sort. So you see if, if you number the lines 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0 and 1 are compared, 2 and 3, 4 and 5. So that's the even com comparison then 1 and 2, and 3 and 4. Even, odd, even, odd, even, odd. So this is sort of like the linear array sorting algorithm. There are six processors, and I use six steps of odd, even transposition sort to sort. So based, if that even odd transposition sort is correct, then this sorting network is also correct. Now, is this a good sorting network? It turns out that it isn't because the cost is order n squared, it's easily computed. The delay is order n, and cost times delay is order n cubed. Remember that sequentially we can sort n numbers in order log n time. Okay, and then the number of comparisons is order n log n. 
uh, sorry, or the n log n time, and also comparisons, how many comparisons we need to do is order n log n. Okay, so here, basically, we are doing the number of comparisons is order n squared. Each comparator basically does one comparison. Okay, it's never reused because data just flows through. So if you have order and squared comparators, you're doing order and squared comparisons. So this is not very efficient. Here are two more designs. One is based on insertion sort, and one is based on selection sort. So what is insertion sort? Insertion sort says it's a recursive procedure that says to sort n numbers, sort n minus one numbers, and then insert this last number in its proper place. And these comparators basically allow us to do that. So compare this with the largest value from the n sorter, switch them if this is larger, then compare it with the next larger, switch them if this is larger. So this value basically, uh, sorry, I should, I should say smaller because we, we sort from small to large. So if this value is small, it should sort of bubble up, move up to its proper place. So if this is smaller than that one, it moves up, goes here. Otherwise, nothing happens. If it's smaller than that one, it moves up, and eventually it moves to its proper place in the sorted order. So this is insertion sort. Selection sort basically is based on picking the largest value in the input list and outputting it directly and then sorting the remaining parts of the list. And finding the largest is basically done by this series of comparators. Compare x0 and x1, this is the larger of the two. Compare that with x2, this is the larger, largest of the three. Compared with x3 and so on. Eventually the largest one sinks to the bottom and its output and then the remaining n minus 1 values are sorted. Now, if I unroll these two recursive schemes, both of them basically yield this sorting network. Notice that for this case, these comparators that you see there, the you know, staircase of comparators is this one. And then this is the smaller n minus 1 input sorting network. That one in turn has these comparators at the end and a still smaller sorting network and so on. For this one, this staircase pattern there is this one. And then again, the n minus one sorter begins with this staircase and so on. Now, is this a good sorting network? Unfortunately not. This is even worse than the previous one. Still order n squared cost. The delay, which was n in the previous one, is now 2n minus 3, so the delay has increased. And cost times delay is still order n cubed. Okay, but these are because easy to understand good examples to start with. Okay? So theoretically optimal sorting networks have order log n depth an order n log n size. Okay, of course, order n log n size is definitely optimal because in sequential sorting, we do order n log n comparisons and in parallel sorting, we can't possibly get away with fewer than order n log n comparisons. And order log n depth is also optimal <coughs> because we are comparing things two at a time in order to compare n things, you need order log n stages in your comparison. So this is theoretically optimal. Unfortunately, these theoretically, these are known as AKS. Uh, the A, K, and S are initials of the three authors who invented this method. 
AKS networks are not practical because the constant in front of these asymptotic notations are huge. It started with four-digit constants. Some improvements were made, but the constants are still fairly large, and therefore these are not practical. But theoretically, it's satisfying to know that we can design uh, optimal sorting networks, but these don't lead to practical design. Existing sorting networks have order log squared n latency, so they are off by a factor of log n in depth, and order n log squared n cost, a factor of log n off from this one. But they are very practical because the constant in front of them are, in fact, in some cases even smaller than one. Okay, so this is truly the order of complexity. A huge constant is not hidden in front. And the factor of log n is not such a big factor anyway, because if even n is uh, 1,024, uh, you know, we, we don't usually design sorting networks that have many thousands of inputs. Even if it's 1,024, log base 2 of n is 10, so there would be the factor 10 increase, which you should compare to that four-digit con constant in front of this, okay? So this is definitely faster, even though asymptotically it's inferior. <clears throat> okay, so let's now go to the first of these practical sorting networks. Um, which is a design due to Ken Batcher. Batcher was one of the pioneers of parallel processing. He did parallel processing in the 1960s, where the field was quite new. And he basically proposed this method. He said, suppose we have a list X and a list Y that are already sorted. So x0, x1, x2, x3 are already sorted. x0 the smallest, x3 the largest. And y0 through y6 are also sorted. y0 is the smallest, y6 is the largest. Okay, let's see how we can merge these two into an 11 element sorted list. Four and seven, total 11 elements, okay? He developed this recursive design. He said, okay, take the, if you want to merge this list with this list, take the even index elements in this list, x0 and x2, and merge them with y0, y2, y4, y6. So it's converting the problem into a smaller one. This was a 4-7 merger. The first step of the algorithm says design a two three merger so two even elements there and three sorry four four even element so a two four merger this is the two four merger then take the odd index elements x1 x3 there are two there y1 y3 y5 there are three here design a two three merger and then once you are done with those two, I'll tell you how to do those two, all you need is this one level of comparators at the end to finish the job. So merging will be complete after you do these half merges, half of the roughly half of the elements of X merge with half of the elements of Y. The other half elements, the odd index elements of X, merge with odd index elements of Y. And then you just need one more level over here. Okay, so let me show you how this 2-3 merger that we need here is designed. So this is 2, this is 3. The same idea is applied recursively. Take the even index elements of the first list, A0, and the even elements of uh, the second list, B0 and B2, 
and merge them. You need two comparators to do that. Take the odd index element of A and the odd index element of B. They're just one each, so this is basically the merger for the odd. This is the merger for the even. And then you just put a column of comparators. So how do you do one two merger? Well, here's a one two merger. Take the even index element of the first sequence, which happens to have just one element, merge it with the even index elements of the second one, and then take the odd index element. There are no odd index elements here, so that part is empty. And finally put this element, this one comparator. OK, so recursively, the method is applied until we get the full sorter that we need. OK, so how do we prove that this, this scheme leads to a valid merging network? The proof is very interesting. We use the 0, 1 principle. OK, assume that, so x and y are assumed to be zeros and ones, x values and y values. So we can fully characterize the sequence x by saying how many zeros it has, because it's already sorted, right? So if we know it has two zeros, then the sequence will be 0, 0, 1, 1. If, it's, if we say it has three zeros, then it will be 0, 0, 0, 1, OK? So the number of zeros in x is basically all we need to know, and the number of zeros in y. So x has k zeros, y has k prime zeros. And I have to prove that for all possible values of k and k prime, this uh, merging network is correct. So let's see what happens here. The sequence v which results after merging x0, x2 with y0, y2, y4, y6 has six elements. The sequence w, which results from merging the odd index elements, has five elements. v has this many zeros, a ceiling of k over 2 plus ceiling of k prime over 2. Because when you take the even index elements, half of the zeros basically are among the even index elements. And half of the zeros are among the odd index elements. But the odd index element is floor. So for example, here, I, if I have, let's say, three zeros, if x has three zeros, then there will be two zeros among the even index elements and one zero among the odd index elements, okay? If I have just two zeros, then there will be one among the even index elements and one among the odd index. So among the even index elements, I have ceiling of k over two zeros. Among the odd index, floor of k over two. So the sum of these two will be k. Similarly for y, it will be k prime over 2. OK? So I call this k even, the number of zeros among the even index element, and k odd, the number of zeros among the odd index elements. And then. Now, these numbers are either the same, ceiling of k over 2 and floor of k over 2 are either the same, or this one is larger than this one by 1. So the difference between k even and k odd is at most 2. So k even can be equal to k odd. That's when both k and k prime are even. k even can be 1 more than k odd. And k even can be 2 more than k odd. And the latter case happens when both k and k prime are odd. So let's examine these three cases. If k even is equal to k odd, v and w, remember, they're interleaved. 
we have this situation. V starts with a bunch of zeros. W starts with a bunch of zeros, and the number of zeros are equal, and then V continues with ones. Well, the sequence now is already sorted, okay? It starts with a bunch of zeros and then moves to ones and continues with ones. So that case is no problem. If k even is one more than k odd, then this is the situation. So v will have one more zero compared with w. Again, the sequence is already sorted. So here are the zeros in the sequence. And then at some point, we switch to ones. and So that case is not a problem either. If k even is two more than k odd, this is the situation. So this is, there are two more zeros there than here. Then we start with zeros, no problem there. These two are out of order. And there will be just one pair of elements that are out of order because there are only two more zeros there. And the order of those two elements will be fixed by one of these, depending on where this occurs. It can occur up here, or it can occur here, or it in any case, these comparators will fix the problem. We'll put the zero here, and we'll put the one here, and we are done. Okay, notice how easy the proof becomes when you use the zero one principle. Otherwise, it would be a pretty difficult proof. Okay, so we Badger basically told us how to design a merging network. And the merging network we designed here does not necessarily have the same number of inputs in the two sorted lists. So in this case, we had four and seven. However, in the design of sorting networks, we use equal length sequences. So basically, we design an n over two sorting network and another n over two sorting network, and then merge these using a merger design that we now know how to do, and this becomes a sorting network. How do you design an n over 2 sorter? Well, you design two n over 4 sorters, so you recurse the recursive, plus merger. Okay, so you go back until you get to two sorters, in which case you know how to sort two numbers. Okay, Batcher's MM. So now we are interested in merging networks that have the same number of inputs on the two, uh, two lists. Batcher's MM, even odd merger, for M at power of 2, has a complexity C of M, which is 2 C of M over 2 plus M minus 1. Okay, why is this? Okay, the number of these comparators is m minus 1. If you have m inputs here and m inputs here, this will be m minus 1. Okay, because there are two m inputs here. The first one is not connected to any comparator, so there will be half as many comparators as there are lines here. So that's m minus 1. And 2CM, uh, basically, we have two of these half mergers, okay? Okay, so if we unroll this recurrence and solve it, the cost of a Batcher MM merger is M log 2M, roughly, plus 1. And the delay is log 2M plus 1. So it has log the merger has logarithmic latency and order m log m cost. But the merger is just one component in the sorter. The cost of the sorting network is two times the cost of the half sorters plus this formula here, the cost formula with m replaced by n over 2, because we are using n over 2. So n over 2 log 2 n over 2 plus 1, as this simplifies to n, 
log, log squared n divided by 2. So it's order n log squared n. And notice that the constant in front of that is 1 half. Okay. So the asymptotic complexity is really a, an accurate indicator of the total cost because uh, we don't have a large constant in front of it. And similarly, the delay of the sorting network is the de delay of a half sorter plus the delay of this merger, which is log 2n plus 1, log 2n over 2 plus 1. Remember, we have n over 2 inputs in, uh, elements in each of the list. And this simplifies to log 2n, log 2n plus 1 divided by 2. So it's again order log squared n latency with a constant in front of it being 1 half. And cost times delay is order n log to the 4 n. Believe it or not, these networks that were designed in the 1960s are still the best networks that we can design systematically. Okay, very few things in parallel processing have survived from the 1960s, but these designs, which are very ingenious, have stood the test of time, and th these are still among the best sorting network that we can design. So here is an eight input sorting network shown in full. So we have a four sorter and another four sorter and a four four merger. And the four four merger is basically a two two merger for the even element and a two two merger for the odd element. And then these comparatives. Okay, uh, four sorters in turn consist of two two sorters, a one one merger for the even element, a one one merger for the odd element, and this one comparator at the end. Okay, so this is an eight input batcher sorting network. Okay, by tonic sequence sorters, uh, if you are interested, please read it. But because we return to by tonic, by tonic sequence sorting when we talk about hypercubes, I'm going to skip these. This is just another way of designing batcher sorting networks. I'm going to skip these for now. Uh, and uh, if you are interested, you can read it. They're pretty easy to understand. But we'll come back to bitonic sorting uh, near the end of the course. Okay, here's another class of sorting networks. They are known as periodic balanced sorting networks. Okay, this particular sorting network for eight inputs consists of three blocks, three identical blocks. That's why they're called periodic. So the structure is periodic. Okay, and balanced means the number of comparators connected to each line is exactly the same. So these four comparators are connected to all the different lines. These four comparators here are connected. So each line up to here is connected to three comparators. Three more comparators, three. So each line in this design is connected to nine comparators. So load is balanced on all the lines. Okay, that's a, that's a desirable property. The periodic property basically allows us to lay out one of these segments in BLSI and then replicate that layout three times. So it's less work for BLSI layout. Okay. Uh, furthermore, we can design a lower complexity sorting network by sharing in these blocks. In this case, I have three blocks. What if I just implement one of these blocks in hardware? 
then pass data through it, store the results in register, and then feed it back to the same block because this block is identical in structure to the second and to the third. So use the same block three times. So this is sort of a lower cost sorting network. Of course, it will be slower as well, but at least it's possible to trade off uh, speed for cost. Okay, if I include an extra block, in other words, instead of three, I put four, the fourth one will be redundant, of course, under normal conditions. Uh, it tolerates some faults, uh, which are missed exchanges. So if, if a comparator basically has to exchange because the values are out of order, but misses that because it's faulty, then that extra block basically allows me to still sort correctly. So it's easy to make these fault tolerant. All right. So, and this is, uh, uh, look at the structure of these blocks. Uh, it's very easy to remember this design. So basically, uh, first and last, second and next to the last are compared in this first level. Then among these four, first and last, second and next to last, first and last, second, and finally among two. Okay, so this is, there are eight inputs. This is log n, log of eight levels. And there are log eight levels, these blocks, so the latency of this design is log squared. So it's a little bit worse than Batcher network, which was one half log squared. This is log squared. But these other advantages may make up for that drawback. Okay, so this is a second design for sorting network that are fairly efficient. Okay, here is another design. It's based on shear sort, okay? Basically, if you have data on a two by four mesh, we will see shear sort in detail later. Uh, basically, if you do snake-like row sort, so sort the first row in this direction and the second row in this direction, and then if you do column sort from top to bottom, and then do another snake-like row sort, the entire mesh will be sorted in snake-like order, okay? So this is snake-like row sort here. So uh, elements zero, one, two, three are sorted by this fourth order. Elements four, five, six, seven are sorted by this in this order. Then we have column sort, zero and seven are compared, one and six, two and five, three and four, zero and seven, uh, one and six, and so on. So this is the column sort. And this is another snake-like row sort. So this gives me a sorting network derived based on this shear sort algorithm for meshes. Now, these designs share some of the positive attributes of periodic balance sorting networks. In particular, you see the repetition. These two blocks are repeated, repeated here. So if I lay out the row sort part and the column sort, just repeating that, in this case, the column sort does not need to be repeated, but if, if this were a bigger mesh, then we would have more column sort. So repetition of this part basically generates uh, the full sorting network. So it's periodic. And fault tolerance, again, can be achieved by including additional copies of these stages, extra stages. This one, I'll leave it up to you. So that one was a 2 by 4 mesh. This one's a 4 by 2 mesh. And the sorting algorithm for this one says 
do snake like row sort do column sort again snake like row sort then again column sort and so row sort here is basically because each row is of size 2 this is row sort uh, this is column sort. Okay, for the left column, this is column sort for the right column. Again, row sort, left column, right column, and finally row sort. Again, you see this is periodic, and it's a different sorting network. Uh, so one has to compare it to the other one to see which one is better. Okay, the final topic I would like to discuss today is selection networks. Now selection network, uh, we talked about selection algorithm before. Uh, selection can be done through sorting. So if I have a sorting network and eight inputs, I sort them from smallest to largest. Well. I know where to find the third smallest if I'm interested in the third smallest. But just as we said before, uh, sorting is an overkill for the selection problem. Therefore, I want to design a network that gives me the third smallest without actually sorting the whole thing. We can immediately see that from this network, I can remove all of these comparators that you see here because those comparators in no way affect the arrangement you know, the location of this third smallest. Okay, there's no way for these to affect that output. So I can remove those. So a selection network intuitively must be simpler than a sorting network. Okay, unfortunately, we know even less about the design of efficient selection network than we do about sorting network. For sorting networks, at least we have the batcher design. For selection networks, we don't really have any good design methods. Okay, of course, we don't want to sort. That, that's a given. Uh, something short of sorting. In other words, I want to do something that is less complex than order n log squared n and faster than order log squared n. Okay, we don't know how to do that. Okay, actually we can design three categories. We can think about three categories of selection networks. Uh, and these are called categories one, two, and three by Donald Knuth in his uh, famous book. Select the k smallest values and present them in sorted order. In other words, uh, going back to here, I want to have the smallest value up here the second smallest here, and the third smallest here. I don't care at all about what values appear there, as long as the three smallest up there are presented in sorted order. The category two selection network, select the k smallest value. So just basically this one output is of interest. I don't care what two values end up on, up there or down here. And this is obviously a simpler problem because whatever network solves the first problem, type one, so this is the smallest, this is the second, this is the third smallest, of course it also gives us the third smallest. But conceivably we can design simpler networks to solve this simpler problem. And finally select the k smallest values and present them in any order. This is an even simpler problem. So I want the three smallest elements to appear up here. I don't care in what order. I don't want the third smallest to necessarily appear here. As long as these three collectively are the three smallest elements, I'm satisfied. So in this last category, uh, 
so the, these are the three cases uh, the four smallest appear in sorted order there for an 8-4 selector the fourth smallest appear here I don't care what else goes there and the four smallest in any order appear here so the four smallest element appear on these outputs um, in no particular order okay so this is a type 3 selection network for 8 inputs it's called 8 classified it's called 8 classified it basically classifies the input into the smaller input and the larger inputs and you see that this is simpler than an 8 input sorting network okay and one can prove mathematically given that the size is fairly small that this is actually an 8 classifier and the notation you see here I'll let you follow uh, the proof on your own this basically says the rank of this element here can be anywhere from 0 to 7 so this can be the smallest element or the largest or anything in between and similarly for the other inputs once we compare these two we can deduce mathematically that the rank of this one will be a, because this is actually smaller than this one therefore the rank can go only up to six and the rank of this uh, bottom one can start at one okay if you continue like this you basically deduce that the rank of this element is zero to three this one is one to three this one's one to three this one's zero three so all four of these are the four smallest and similarly here I have the four largest so I can prove mathematically that this is a valid eight classifier or a type 3 selection network with eight inputs of course if I have if I know how to design classifiers this gives me another way of designing uh, sorting networks so I start with an eight classifier so these are the four smallest these are the four largest I use a four classifier these are the two smallest among the four smallest okay and finally a two classifier and everything will be sorted at the end so one other approach to designing sorting networks is to try to design efficient classifier networks and then basically assemble them into a structure such as this one to get a sorting network okay so that's it for our discussion of sorting and selection networks uh, next time we talk about next lecture lecture eight uh, we'll talk about search acceleration circuit chapter 8a uh, bye for now take care and stay safe